Welcome to the Villains and Virgins podcast. This is episode two of a mini-series on the Great Schism. Now, in the last episode, the stage is set for the family that's going to burst into history in this episode. You have to remember that the time period we're talking about is the 900s, so the early 10th century. And the Roman Empire in the West has pretty much disintegrated. All of what we now know as Italy is a territory that's being fought over by various different tribes. There are Lombards, Goths, Franks, Huns, even some Muslims from time to time. So it's chaotic. There isn't really a strong centralized authority or government of any kind, nothing that would resemble an empire. There are small little territories that are governed by competing warlords or chieftains, and these territories are constantly contested. The city of Rome, as the capital of a powerful empire, is no more. The city is still there, but the empire around it has all but disappeared. It's chaotic. And inside the city itself, violence, looting, and murder are commonplace in the streets. It's a terrain that's contested by powerful families who have their own armed factions, and they're jockeying for control of the city, and in particular, for control of the office of Pope. Because as we learned in the last episode, that position has now become not just a position of religious leadership, but a position that is incredibly wealthy. The Pope has become the Prince of Rome and a powerful landowner in his own right. And so this position is now coveted by all of the powerful families in the city. And they're constantly putting forward their own candidates and trying to murder or blind or get rid of the candidates of other families. So people who do successfully occupy the office of Pope tend not to do so for very long. So it's in this environment that we're going to meet a family that is as murderous and power-hungry as any character in the Game of Thrones that you might call to mind. It's a period that historians have sometimes referred to as as the pornocracy, which translated from the Greek literally means the rule of prostitutes. And if you thought that there'd be a lot of sex involved here, you'd be right. The family is known as the House of Theophylact because of the man of the family whose name it is. But the astonishing thing about this family is that its power was wielded by its women. A woman named Theodora, who was the wife of Theophylact, and their daughter Morosia. Now you have to remember that for women to wield power in this society was almost a crime in and of itself. Rome, like Greece at the time, had very restrictive roles for women. They weren't allowed to vote. They weren't allowed to hold any sort of office that was religious, uh, in government, or in the military. Their sphere was domestic. And while a capable woman could aspire to manage a household, a large household with slaves and property, Her role was very much circumscribed by her relationship to her husband and her father. So what we know of the women of the House of Theophylact, first and foremost, is that they left these expectations behind. And this may be their greatest crime. Well, perhaps not their greatest crime. There's quite a long list, and I'll let you be the judge of that. But the other thing to keep in mind is that everything we know about these women comes to us from the writings of men who were not sympathetic witnesses. For most men of the time, the idea of a woman who exercised power like a man was in and of itself scandalous, never mind what she might actually choose to do with that power. So the lens that we have to view this picture of these women is one that is painted very thickly by a perspective that's already negative towards them before they've actually done anything. According to a man named Liudprand, who personally knew several of the characters in this story, he was a contemporary, he says, quote, A certain shameless strumpet called Theodora at one time was sole monarch of Rome, and shame though it is to write it, 
exercised power like a man. So you get a sense of the perspective that he brings before he actually tells the story that he knows about this family. Now this Theodora that we're going to talk about should not be confused with another very powerful Theodora who became Empress of the East, the Byzantine Empire in Constantinople. That was another very interesting and scandalous woman, but that's another story for another day. This Theodora of the House of Theophylact comes from a family that originated in a small town called Tusculanum on the outskirts of Rome. That is where the family property was, and it was from this location that members of the family would journey into Rome to make their careers. Theodora is mentioned by name in the records, and she's also referred to by the title Senatrix, which has to do with rulership in Rome. So Theodora's husband, Theophylact, wasn't exactly a pushover either. He was officially a judge, likely the head of the Roman army, and led a diplomatic mission at one point. So he's a wealthy man with a lot of influence, but the dynamics in Rome are extremely volatile, they're extremely chaotic, and the balance of power and alliances are shifting constantly. So retaining the influence of the family depends on constantly building and monitoring alliances. And in this department, Theodora is an expert. As an example of this, she arranges for her extremely young daughter, Morosia, by some reports barely out of puberty, to meet the current Pope, Sergio, and to become his mistress. So you gotta think about this for a second. This is a woman who's taking her daughter, really what we would consider a child, and offering her up to the Pope for sexual purposes in order to create an ongoing relationship of benefit between the Pope and her family. Because remember, the Pope is a powerful office and having influence there is part of what makes her family powerful. So her daughter Morosia, very young, gives birth to a son by the Pope. And this is a child that we're going to hear about later as our story unfolds. But Morosia's career as a player in the power game begins extremely early at this point. When Pope Sergio died, Theodora successfully backed and placed two more candidates into the position of Pope. Now, this is no mean feat. I mean, it is the single most coveted position in Rome because it involves mad amounts of money. So every wealthy family is desperately trying to get one of their own onto the papal seat wearing the papal gown. And it's usually an extremely bloody process. Uh, in the past, in the previous episode, we talked about various popes who would get into the chair and last a few months or a year before being murdered. To get one's own candidate onto the papal seat was extremely challenging, highly contested. And the fact that Theodora got her preferred candidate onto that seat twice in succession is a measure of her ability. Each of the candidates she put on the throne, by the way, only lasted about a year before dying. So there were other people who were rapidly trying to remove these candidates even as she put them into the office. So after the second of Theodora's candidates dies, she does something that makes the chroniclers of the time sort of gasp with horror. So here's the story. Theodora had a lover, well, by some accounts, quite a few, but this particular lover was an ambitious young cleric called John. And he would visit Rome regularly, and under Theodora's patronage and with her influence, was rapidly being promoted to ever more attractive positions within the church hierarchy. Now, he eventually succeeds in landing the very attractive job of Bishop of Ravenna, which is a city in Italy. The problem is Ravenna isn't so conveniently located next to Rome, and so John's visits back to Rome become less frequent. So Theodora devises an ingenious solution. She makes John an offer he can't refuse. She tells him, come to Rome and I will make you Pope. 
And of course, the chroniclers can't help but pointing out that her main motivation for this was to have more regular access to him in the bedroom. In any case, she succeeds in placing John on the papal seat, and he remains pope for several years. In fact, there is an interesting alliance that goes on at this point, because Theodora is still very much married to her husband, Theophylact, who's a powerful man in his own right. She's in bed with the current pope, and she recruits the services of another very useful man, a Frankish warlord named Alaric, who is soon going to become her son-in-law. So she has relationships with all three of these men, and because she is the connection between them, their actions are at times coordinated for a period of time in Rome, much to the benefit of Theodora's family. But wait, I can hear some of you wondering about this. Aren't popes and priests and clerics supposed to be celibate? Well, the answer is not exactly. Celibacy wasn't strictly required by church law until 1138, so we're about 200 years before that. But even though it wasn't officially required, it was very much encouraged. And certainly having extremely young mistresses, bastard children, and sleeping with the wives, uh, other people's wives, the wives of powerful men, it wasn't a good thing at all. However, the office of Pope and many of the other higher offices of the church at this point had ceased to be occupied by people who had primarily devout motivations. So powerful men do what powerful men always do, which is pretty much whatever they can get away with. And in this story, these powerful men got away with quite a lot. Now, as a side note, the position of celibacy for churchmen in the East in the eastern part of the Roman Empire, which we talked about in the last episode, was a bit different than the West. In the West, celibacy eventually becomes required, so you're not supposed to be sleeping with anybody. In the East, it was encouraged, but married men could become officials in the church. It was possible. Uh, or officials in the church could sometimes marry. So they weren't as strict about celibacy in the East as in the West. But in both places, having all kinds of salacious sex with people that you weren't married to, and people who were married to other people, was always a bad thing. So back to Theodora. Having put her own lover, John, into the papal office, she now has to do something about her daughter, Morosia, whose powerful lover, the previous pope, three popes ago, is gone. So Morosia is now available again as a pawn, and her mother comes up with a new arrangement for her. So there's a man called Alberic, sometimes called the King of Spoleto, because he's effectively controlled a certain amount of territory in Italy. So he's a feudal landowner, and he's obtained this land through force. He has a large band of armed Frankish men, and they're very, very useful to have around, because Theodora's family, the House of Theophylact, depends on force and wealth, but especially force. Rome is controlled by these factions who have armed gangs that run around and subdue the supporters of other families and cause difficult people or papal candidates to disappear. So having this man, Alberic, and his well-trained band of Frankish followers with their well-sharpened swords is extremely useful to Theodora. So she gets her daughter, Morosia, to marry Alberic. And in due course, the young woman produces a second son, who is going to be called Alberic the Younger. And he's going to have a role to play in the story that unfolds. Now, what ultimately happens to Theodora, her husband Theophylact, and this Alberic the Frank? We don't actually know what their ultimate fate was. It was an extremely chaotic time. And they sort of disappear from the scanty records that were kept. That's sometimes why they call it the Dark Ages, because record-keeping was so scarce. What we do know is that in 924, Theophylact and Alberic and many other Romans were involved in banding together to repel an attack on Rome from a force of Muslim fighters. Now, this wasn't the first time that Muslims had come up from the south to raid Rome. In fact, Muslim rule over Sicily, the southernmost tip of Italy, had begun in 861 and continued until 1061. 
So we often think about Muslim forces as being located in the Middle East, but you have to remember that at this time they were enormously expansionary, and Sicily isn't that far from Rome. They were very much players in the near neighborhood, and they were competing for power and land along with the Lombards, the Franks, the Goths, and sometimes even the Huns. So in 924, the House of Theophylact, Alberic, and many others successfully repel this foreign incursion, and then they disappear from the records. What we do know is that by 926, two years later, Morosia is without her powerful parents, and she's without her Frankish warlord husband, Alberic. But she does have two young sons, and she's still part of a powerful clan. And like her mother, she's inherited a knack for building and maintaining strategic alliances, and she harbors enormous ambition. We know that Morosia succeeded her mother Theodora in exercising control of Rome because she is referred to in the records that remain as Senatrix, or Lord of Rome. Now at this point, Pope John, her mother Theodora's former lover, is still Pope. But for some reason that we don't know, Morosia absolutely detests him. And this makes his position really precarious, because with so many contestants, with so many people who want to control and own the office of Pope, if Morosia's family isn't supporting him, he's in an extremely dangerous position. Furthermore, Pope John's brother Peter, who is a nobleman with his own land holdings and interests, has begun to clash with the interests of the House of Theophylact. So they have additional reasons to want to get rid of Pope John and his brother. So Pope John is frantically seeking an ally, someone outside of Rome who can provide some level of protection and security for him against the House of Theophylact. And he turns to a man called Hugh of Provence. Hugh is a landowner, he's powerful, he has a lot of fighting men at his command. But Morosia isn't one to sit around and rest quietly while she allows John to fortify his position. In fact, she's already gotten ahead of him. Because while John has been thinking about what to do, Morosia has already offered herself in marriage to another man called Guy of Tuscany. Now, Guy just happens to be the half-brother of Hugh of Provence, which is very unlikely to be a coincidence. After all, how much of an ally is Hugh of Provence going to be for John against Morosia if she's already married into his family? Now, in case you're having difficulty keeping track, because Morosia is still a very young woman, this is her second official marriage and her third very significant relationship with a powerful man. She's already been the mistress of a pope, the wife of a Frankish warlord, and now she's offering herself to another man who's also got a very large force of fighting men at his command. So Morosia marries Guy of Tuscany. And what this means is that when Pope John's troublesome brother, Peter, comes back to Rome, Morosia's thugs have him murdered right there in front of Pope John. And then Pope John himself gets thrown into prison by Morosia's henchmen, where he dies. It's not clear how quickly he died, it might have been fairly soon, but she arranged for him to disappear and never to be heard of again. Now this concept is kind of foreign to the world that we live in. The idea that a powerful Italian family could sort of grab a pope by his collar and throw him into jail and, and kill him. But it's very much a measure of the world that Morosia lived in, and it was her hand that was very firmly on the reins of control. Now Morosia's ultimate plan was to put her own older son into the office of pope. The problem was he was still very young. So for the next six years, Morosia kept the seat warm for him by installing a couple of other men as Pope. So she would install one of them, uh, he would be Pope for a while, and when he ceased to be compliant uh, or flexible and responsive to her demands, she'd have him killed, and then she'd put someone else into the papal seat. So by the time the second interim Pope was dispatched, 
Marozia decided that the time was ripe to put her own older son, John, into the office of Pope. How old was her son? Probably in his late teens, perhaps 18 or 19. So you have to think of this teenager who's now suddenly got the moral leadership of the Western half of the Christian world. He's also the, an incredibly rich landowner. He's officially the Prince of Rome, so he has this political and governing office and enormous amounts of cash. And at this point, having moved the office of Pope from something that she has a close alliance to, to something that she owns because it's in her family and it's her son sitting there, Marozia decides it's time to dispense with her husband. Guy of Tuscany has served his purpose. He's been the strong arm behind her designs for the last six years as she's shuffled men through the papal office. And now that she's succeeded in putting her son, John, on the throne, she has no further need for Guy. So the sources suggest that when Guy conveniently dies at this point, it's Morosia's doing. We don't know exactly how Guy of Tuscany dies. But we do know that the very next year, in 931, Morosia has put an even more audacious plan into action. She's proposed marriage to Hugh of Provence. Remember Hugh? That's right. He's the powerful feudal lord that a previous unfortunate pope, also called John, was trying to enlist as an ally against Morosia. So Marozia has married and probably murdered this man's half-brother, Guy, and now is proposing marriage to Hugh of Provence herself. Now Marozia is probably at this point still in her 30s, physically very alluring, but that's not what makes her proposal irresistible. What she tells Hugh is that if he comes to Rome and marries her, in addition to a very powerful alliance of her wealth and his military force and land, her son, the Pope, will crown them emperor and empress of the West. Now, the Western Roman Empire hasn't really existed for some time, so no one else has this title, and Marozia is effectively reinventing it as something that her son, the Pope, can bestow. And that's what she says is going to happen. So for Hugh, it's a tempting offer because it offers a higher rank than anyone else has access to, and potentially the authority to govern a far larger range of territory than he's hitherto been able to touch. It's an offer that Hugh finds irresistible. Now, if you looked up the word unscrupulous in the dictionary, you might find a portrait of Hugh of Provence staring back at you. He was very much the bad boy of his generation. Contemporary sources describe his court as a brothel, and Hugh himself as a satyr. What that means, if I translate it for you, is basically that Hugh was having sex with any woman within arm's reach and doing it in a repeated flamboyant and scandalous way. So he had a reputation. He was also a feudal lord with an enormous amount of land and power, and, inconveniently, he was already married when Marozia made her stunning proposal. But he wasn't going to let that stop him. Hugh's wife had the good grace to die very conveniently uh, shortly after he received Marozia's proposal. With her out of the way, the path was clear, at least until other people in Hugh's family began to make objections. Isn't Marozia the widow of your half-brother, so marrying her would kind of be incest? No way, said Guy. I was never related to that guy anyway. My mother was an adulterous whore. Who knows who she was sleeping with? I don't think I ever had any relationship to Guy of Tuscany. At this point, some of Hugh's other brothers, one in particular, objected to this slandering of their mother's reputation. But Hugh had that brother's eyes gouged out and had him thrown into prison. So that was the end of the vocal public criticism of his plan. With those things eliminated, the coast was clear for Hugh to go to Rome and accept Marozia's offer. At this point, Marozia stands on the threshold of consolidating more power than her family has ever been able to control before. But it's just at this moment that things begin to unravel. It's her 
third marriage, and she has two sons already. One of them she's just made pope. But the problem is her younger son, Alberic. Alberic the Younger. He was the son of that Frankish warlord, Alberic, who disappeared sometime earlier after the Muslim invasion. And his son seems to be a little bit like his father, in that he's not interested in playing a subordinate sideline role. So while he's watching his brother become pope, and his mother prepare to marry Hugh of Provence, he's wondering, what's going to happen to me? And the things that he's hearing are extremely unsettling. Rumor has it, rumor that's reached young Alberic's ears, that Hugh of Provence is planning to have him blinded. Because at that time, it was a really convenient way of sort of disabling and removing other young males who might become competitors in the future. And the same rumor also suggests that his mother, Morosia, didn't really make any objections to this idea. So young Alberic is extremely concerned about the imminent marriage between his mother and this completely unscrupulous Hugh of Provence. Hugh of Provence arrives with his army outside the gates of Rome in the spring of 932. Now, Morosia is aware that the Roman public will respond very poorly to large numbers of armed foreign men coming through the city streets. So she instructs Hugh to leave his army outside the city and to come into the city with a small band of men to ensure the security of his person. And his destination is the Castle Sant'Angelo, which is where the wedding of the century is going to take place. Hugh arrives, and in due course, the teenage pope conducts the marriage ceremony between Morosia and Hugh of Provence. The coronation is going to come sometime in the near future, but not at that time. What happens next is several days of feasting, eating, and drinking. So it's during one of these evenings of revelry that Morosia's younger son, Alberic, is instructed to pour water on the hands of Hugh of Provence. So to understand what this means, let's back up for a second. You have to think of these sorts of dinners as being long tables covered with large platters of food and people sort of digging in and eating with their hands. So it was a messy business. Your hands would get greasy, covered in sauce, uh, very dirty, and so you'd need to have them washed at regular intervals. And so you'd either be bathing them in a basin, or you'd have a servant who would come and pour water over your hands, and then you would wipe them, dry them, and, and carry on. But the fact that Morosia, this ruler of Rome, is instructing her son Alberic to pour water for Hugh of Provence's hands is a calculated humiliation. There's no way this is a coincidence. She is putting her younger son in the role of a servant, and doubtless underlining his subordinate position relative to his stepfather, who he's physically serving in this way. Now, the teenaged young Alberic is pouring the water, and he spills it. Was it deliberate? Was it an accident? Who knows? What we do know is that Hugh of Provence responds immediately and violently. He backhands the young man, sends him flying, and young Alberic gets onto his feet and runs out of the banquet hall. Alberic flees the banquet hall, he flees the castle, he goes out into the streets of Rome, and according to contemporary sources, he says something like this, quote, the majesty of Rome has sunk to such depths that now she obeys the orders of harlots. Could there be anything viler than that the city of Rome should be brought to ruin by the impurities of one woman, and that those who were once our slaves should now be our masters? If he should hit me, his stepson, when he had only recently come as our guest, what do you suppose he will do when he has taken root in the city? So Alberic is targeting a deep-rooted resentment. The Romans were citizens of a city that had once ruled a vast empire. And all these other tribes, these Franks, these Goths, these Visigoths, used to be subordinate peoples in their empire. And now you have a foreigner, this Hugh of Provence, who's coming to sit inside of Rome and effectively become one of its rulers. So it's 
someone who used to be a member of a subordinate group now coming to rule over the Romans themselves. And Alberic knows he's hitting a nerve. And the people of Rome rise up. An armed mob follows Alberic back to the castle San Angelo, yelling, screaming, and bearing weapons. Now, of course, there were people who resented the rule of foreigners. There were probably also a number of very powerful families in Rome who were also afraid of Morosia's stunning consolidation of power and what it would mean for them. So it's very likely that some of the armed groups of thugs who were already employed by these families made up a large portion of the mob that now proceeded loudly towards the wedding feast in the castle. Upon hearing that an angry and armed mob was coming towards the castle, Hugh of Provence did something astonishing. The Castle San Angelo is a fortress. It's not difficult for a smaller number of people to defend it against a larger number of potential invaders. But Hugh doesn't make any effort to defend the castle. In fact, he lets himself down by a rope onto the stone city wall the outside perimeter of the city, he gets down off the wall outside of Rome and rejoins his army that's encamped outside the gates. So he effectively abandons Morosia and his plan to be emperor of the West. The mob then gains access to the castle and they capture Morosia herself, whom they then hand over to her slighted younger son, Alberic. Now, this places Alberic in a very difficult situation. Remember, he's still a teenager, and he's very skillfully avoided his own disaster at the hands of Hugh of Provence. But now this mob of angry Romans is handing over to him a woman who would stop at nothing to expand her control on power. A woman who reportedly would even al allow her own son to be blinded. But she's also his mother. And having her killed outright doesn't sit well with teenage Alberic. So what does he do? He has her locked up in the dungeons underneath the castle Sant'Angelo to live out the rest of her life in darkness and obscurity. We don't know how many years Morosia must have paced the dungeons of that castle, ranting at the life going on above and everything that she'd lost. But certainly her presence rests like an unquiet spirit on the other members of her family who are going to continue this story. Because the House of Theophylact is by no means finished doing scandalous things, despite the best intentions of her upright younger son, Alberic. Morosia had been mistress of one pope, mother of a second, and will be the grandmother of one yet to come. So Alberic allows his older brother, John. Morosia had two sons, remember? John has become Pope and Alberic is the second son. So Alberic allows his big brother to stay Pope in Rome, but he does something really astute. He separates the religious office of Pope from the political and land owning power of Prince of Rome, which had been attached to the office of Pope for many decades now. And in separating these two, he, Alberic, becomes Prince of Rome. So he takes over the governance, the collection of taxes, the political power. He lets his older brother retain the religious office. By doing this, he eliminates the murderous competition for the office of Pope that has obsessed the most wealthy and powerful Italian families for generations. Although he's barely out of his teens, young Alberic makes a sober and effective ruler of Rome. And in his lifetime, a semblance of law and order returns to the city. The violence and lawlessness in the streets abates, the political and religious powers are separated, and the people of Rome remember his rule as a good one. You wouldn't have expected that from a teenager. In fact, the Romans are so fond of him that they remain loyal and supportive of his rule, even when nasty old Hugh of Provence comes sneaking back sometime later, trying to stage a return to power through, th through threats and bribery. The Romans are interested. Alberic retains control. But Alberic only lives until about 40, 
when he contracts a fever, it's very severe, and he must have had some suspicion that it was going to be the end of him. Because while he's lying in bed sick, he gathers his ministers around him and he instructs them as to what they're going to do if he dies. So in his last illness, Alberic makes his ministers agree to set up his son as both Pope and Prince of Rome, combining in these last days of his life the very two offices that he had spent so much effort separating. And by fusing them together again, he's going to open the way to a series of events that will prove disastrous. In the next episode, we're going to cover the salacious and disastrous doings of the House of Theophylact as they continue to dominate the office of Pope, setting the stage for the most serious shattering of the Christian world that has ever occurred. If you enjoyed this episode, please send it in a message or an email to someone else that you think would enjoy hearing it. And don't forget to subscribe to the Villains and Virgins podcast so that you won't miss the next episode with all the craziness that's about to unfold.